Uh, my name is Andy Morovchik. I'm a professor of politics here. I'm also director of the Liechtenstein Institute on Self-Determination, or LISD as we call it. And on behalf of uh, LISD, as well as the other sponsors of today's event, the Center for International Security Studies and Princeton School of Inter uh, International and Public Affairs, um, I'd like to welcome all of you to this discussion. Um, LISD is very pleased to be involved in this conversation um, because the issue we're discussing today, transnational repression, uh, is a topic that e exists, although we don't yet study it. Um, it exists at the intersection of lots of things that LISD and other institutions here study, teach, research, work on as activists, um, organize events around. And these include national sovereignty, human rights, the actions of non-state actors, um, globalization and an informationally rich globalized economy and international armed conflict. And the particular urgency of today's session stems from the fact that in recent years the US government, as many of you I'm sure know, have brought multiple prosecutions against individuals committing what is alleged to be uh, transnational repression in the United States on behalf of foreign governments. Um, in these prosecutions, I believe it's to date limited to the People's Republic of China and one case of alleged kidnapping by Iran, but there are um, other countries about which the American government is concerned. Um, and these include the uh, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, um, and of course there's events we read about in newspapers, Saudi Arabia, and so on. So, and these are things that touch universities because we have so many foreign nationals on our campuses. Um, and so this has been a, a hotspot for this kind of concern. We've um, assembled a panel to give you a set of diverse views from diverse places about this particular um, problem. So we're pleased to have uh, Professor Sahara Aziz uh, join us. She's a professor at Rutgers Law School, where her research focuses on an interdisciplinary approach to national security, race, and civil rights with a focus on minorities. Professor Aziz previously served as senior policy advisor for the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. So please join me in welcoming Professor Aziz. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to Professor Lori Crew and the, and the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs under the excellent leadership of Dr. Amani Jamal uh, for hosting us today. And thank you to the FBI for engaging with us. And thank you to my colleague at Seton Hall just down the street. Um, so I want to make three key points today. The first is that the rise of transnational repression correlates with a general demographic, excuse me, democratic regression worldwide especially in the Middle East and North Africa, which is what I'll be focusing on today. The second point is that private, private technology firms and social media have actually made transnational repression much easier to execute by authoritarian regimes without detection or accountability. And finally, transnational repression is most prevalent against Muslims by Muslim-majority countries and China against the Uyghurs. Specifically, 78% of the cases that were studied in the Freedom, by Freedom House in their 2021 report are people of Muslim identity. Uh, again, reflecting the high proportion of Muslim majority states engaged in TNR, transnational oppression, and the vulnerability of Muslims in migration. So since the United States declared a global war on terror in 2001, authoritarians across the world have been emboldened to overtly repress their domestic political opposition. Autocrats no longer had to be discreet in their repression of dissidents. Instead, they merely labeled dissidents as terrorists and anyone supporting them as threats to national security, which then granted these regimes license to engage in TNR, including surveillance, proxy punishment, coerced returns, threats, enforced disappearances, and lethal retribution. And if faced with criticism of such practices from the US government, the regimes merely pointed out that their practices were not that much different than the CIA's extraordinary rendition program, indefinite detention and waterboarding at Guantanamo Bay, torture in Abu Ghraib, immigration and roundups of Arabs and Muslims in the United States, and other national security practices. So if the United States could violate human rights without accountability, then so too could these regimes. <laughs> 
The global war on terror thus gave autocrats a political carte blanche to openly repress their domestic opposition in exchange for cooperation with the United States and Europe in global counterterrorism initiatives. Now to be sure, the Middle Eastern and North African regimes that I'll discuss today were authoritarian long before 2001. But the post-Cold War world order centered on a single superpower obsessed with routing out so-called radical Islamists across the globe normatively legitimated repression against Islamist political parties and intellectuals by Middle East regimes. Now, just a very brief history. An Islamic revival in the 1970s and 1980s in the region in response to systemic corruption and economic decline led to the rising popularity of the Muslim Brotherhood and other political Islamist groups. Each country applied different tactics to repress this growing political opposition, ranging from brutal repression to co-optation. As a result, many dissidents fled to Western nations, including the United States, where they continued their nonviolent political activism. But this caused the regimes to reach beyond their borders. Nearly all transnational repression required physical surveillance and activity in the dissident's place of exile. For Western and US allies, these Middle Eastern regimes had to be very careful not to leave evidence of their violations of national sovereignty, lest they damage their bilateral relations. Now fast forward three decades when smartphones, social media, and the internet are ubiquitous worldwide. No longer do authoritarian regimes send intelligence officers or informants to physically spy or abduct dis descendants abroad. They need only penetrate computers, mobile devices, email, and social media accounts to access confidential communications and identify where their targets are and who they're talking to. Social engineering tactics trick targets into opening a malicious link or attachment sent by a source impersonating a friend or an organization known to the target. Now once this phishing operation with a PH is executed, the regime can remotely access the dissident's device and their passwords. Now transnational surveillance is so widespread that a separate industry has arisen to assist autocrats to repress their dissidents abroad. For example, the Israel-based vendor NSO Group sells Pegasus to over 45 countries, including Middle East regimes. Phones are then infected with this spyware when a link specifically crafted for the target is opened. The regime's intelligence services then have full access to the microphone and the camera of the dissident. So our computers are, are <laughs> excuse me, our smartphones are very powerful surveillance devices. Spyware is most often used to compromise civil society groups, journalists, academics, and human rights workers, again, working in exile. So, when mass protests spread across the Arab world in 2011, in what we now call the Arab Spring, technology tools were a powerful force multiplier for citizen activists. Decades of tight government control over public spaces, universities, and mosques had pushed activism online. Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp were instrumental in mobilizing millions of people to take to the streets demanding freedom, bread, and social justice. Now concurrent with the local protests was the rise of diasporic activism, which I admittedly was part of here in the United States as an Egyptian American. Teach-ins, media interviews, and lobbying their Western governments, the Arab diaspora supported dissidents from their countries of origin, and they also connected these local dissidents with global media to inform the global public about the regime's oppression and censorship, and also to protect the local dissidents from oppression within those countries' borders. Now, while Egyptians, Tunisians, Libyans, and Yemenis remarkably were able to force out the autocrats and pave the way for new elections, authoritarianism proved too deeply entrenched to be eradicated. Each of these countries is now under the firm gra gra excuse me, grasp of a dictator or embroiled in a civil war. Worse yet, the new dictators learn from the old dictators' mistakes. So now social media, smartphone apps, and the internet have been transformed from a shield against autocracy to a sword of oppression. Intelligence services comb through social media accounts to identify opponents who then face arrest, prosecution, or disappearance. Consequently, a wave of dissidents of all political leanings have escaped to Europe, to Turkey, to the United States, to Canada, where some have resumed their pro-democracy activism. Now in the Gulf, in the Persian Gulf, regimes that were anxious to prevent protests 
from on their soil, increase government jobs, raise public sector salaries, and expanded social welfare benefits to their citizens. Simultaneously, these monarchs aggressively cracked down on dissidents at home or sought to lure those abroad back for punishment. So the United Arab Emirates, for example, deployed pe Pegasus in 2016 to infect the iPhone of human rights defender Ahmed Mansour, who is now serving time in prison for using social media to so threaten public order, which is a very common uh, crime. The horrendous butchering of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, the most high profile uh, example of transnational oppression, exposed the extent to which the Saudi, and Saudi Arabian monarchy will go to silence dissidents. In the summer of 2018, the smartphone of a Saudi political activist in Canada named Omar Abdul Aziz was infected with Pegasus. The Saudi Arabian government could then access Abdul Aziz's personal files, emails, and messages, as well as to monitor his communications and movements. Now, it's no coincidence that Omar Abdul Aziz was a close associate of Jamal Khashoggi, who had been in self-exile from Saudi Arabia for the, in the United States since 2017, after fall, falling out of favor with the authorities. Both men frequently discussed the human rights situation in their home country, and together they started developing a project for social media campaigns against Saudi government propaganda. And in full disclosure, I'm a member, uh, I'm a board member of the Democracy for the Arab World Now organization, Dawn, which was started by Jamal Khashoggi before he was butchered. So a few months after the hacking of Abdul Aziz's phone, Khashoggi was in fact brutally murdered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in an operation coordinated by high-level officials in the government in Riyadh, including the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, one of their best friends. In another egregious case of transnational repression, Saudi Arabia kidnapped Lujan Hatloul, a women's rights activist in 2018 from the United Arab Emirates, where she was studying. And in Egypt, the Sisi regime engages in what is known as proxy punishment on a regular basis. So according to Human Rights Watch, the Egyptian intelligence services have targeted the family members of 29 Egyptian journalists, media workers, and political and human rights activists living abroad. Another 14 dissidents' homes of relatives were visited or raided, and eight dissidents' relatives were banned from travel or had their passports confiscated. Now, many similar cases have occurred in Iran and in Turkey, where even democratically elected governments engage in transnational oppression, and I don't have enough time to go into those, although we've had some discussion of, of the cases of Iran. But I'll end with the case of Maryam Hamoun a Syrian-Canadian activist whose father had been arrested and tortured by the previous president, uh, Bashar al-Assad, Hafiz, Hafiz al-Assad. During the Arab Spring, Maryam was the North American Director of Public Relations and Media for the National Coalition of the Syrian Revolution and Opposition Forces. She's based in Canada. As a member of the Syrian diaspora, she took a public and vocal stance against the Assad regime when man mass protests broke out. And in November 2013, Hamoud's email was infected by spyware, which resulted in sexually graphic pictures being sent to every single male in her contact list. The attackers are suspected to be the Syrian Electronic Army, a group of pro-Assad regime hijackers that have tried to counteract anti-regime stories coming out of Syria and later turned to premeditated attacks against political opposition groups, news outlets, and workers. Now, the experience of Miriam was so traumatic for her that it caused her to cease her activism in order to preserve her own and her family's well-being, which is precisely the chilling effect sought by perpetuators of transnational repression. And her case highlights that even United States, Canadian, or European citizenship does not make the Arab diaspora immune from TNR when they act on the liberal norms taught in Western schools human rights, women's rights, democracy, and freedom. So the most important issue before us today, in my view, is what is our government doing to prevent transnational oppression from its authoritarian allies? It's, is the United States government holding these regimes accountable for violating human rights? The case of Jamal Khashoggi points to business as usual, where human rights, freedom, and international law are treated as impediments to rather than essential to global security. Thank you.